coming out. Um, and today, uh, Mike Steinberg is going to give us a nice history of the Roxy and uh, some interesting stories. Uh, are you thinking about doing some mini tours afterwards? Or? Oh, absolutely, we could do that. So if any of you want to stay, they, you know, show you around a little bit so you can see the back workings. Um, welcome, Mike, and thank you for, you know, putting on this Molly presentation. Absolutely. So. All right. Thanks so much. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. It's warm up here. How are you doing? I'll be right back. I'm, like, I'm kidding, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so, good morning, welcome to uh, the Roxy Theater. Um, my name is Mike Steinberg, I am the executive director of the Roxy Theater, and I have been asked to do a presentation on the history of the Roxy. So, the history of the Roxy is a little bit of the history of Missoula, to some degree, I'm no expert on that, but, uh, but also the history of the film industry, um, and a history of kind of the uh, reshaping of uh, you know community and and culture and like where where we land I think with our relationship to each other um, and very much a story of you know the arts in Missoula so um, just to, just so I know what's going on here <laughs> how many of you have ever been to the Roxy Theater I mean you're here now so that's a trick question you're in the Roxy now how have you ever been, have attended a film at the Roxy Theater. Okay, so keep your hands raised. Yay, thank you very much. Now, how many of you have attended a film here in the last 10 years? Okay, great. Prior to the last 10 years? Okay, very good. Not many of you, <laughs> um, but some of you, so that's great. So there's some, there's some history that you might be familiar with if you remember what the Roxy was like, um, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, I tell you what, the theater itself, this beautiful theater we're sitting in, was built in 1937 as a streamlined deco theater. Its, um, it's uh, intention was to be a second-run theater, which meant that uh, you know, movies would open in some of the other theaters in town. Of course, the glorious Wilma Theater downtown, the Gem, which was on Front Street, or Main, uh, Front Street, also the Fox Theater, which was over on Orange and Front. Um, and once those films played for quite a while, let's say, you know, eight, ten weeks, if they were successful, they would wander over across the bridge uh, into a second-run theater. In larger cities, uh, you know, it, the concept was sort of concentric rings. You know, you'd have a theater district where the films would open, a real big deal, real big theaters that sat, you know, if we were thinking of my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri, we had the glorious Fox Theater, which sat 24,000 people, oh, I'm sorry, 2,400 people. Jeez. Um, yeah, You're real small people is what it was. And they would stack them in there like cordwood and just watch the Jerry Lewis movies. Um, no, it, it sat about 2,400 people. And uh, a movie like, you know, let's, what's a good example of that? Well, you know, Gone with the Wind, uh, you know, would play at the Fox uh, for, you know, uh, weeks, maybe months, and then the print would make its way out to the neighborhood theaters, um, and then again, it was sort of concentric rings from the theaters. So you'd have a second run and then a tertiary run, and then eventually, not at the time of the release of something like Gone with the Wind, but eventually you'd have repertory theaters that would bring movies back, you know, and those would be typically tucked away uh, in, a, in a college neighborhood, for example, which we'll get to. Um, the first movie that ever, actually I wanted to show you this real quick. This is the, the organization as it stands now. We'll get to this later, but the Roxy just as a movie theater was 600 seats when it was built. And it was raked this way. Not three theaters, but one big theater. There was a, uh, uh, you know, a humble balcony of sorts and, uh, and then, you know, a number of seats on the floor and a great big screen on that end, not in this room, but in the next room, which is the, you know, would have been the last theater. Um, our organization um, has a mission to make the world a better place through cinema, through education, and through community. Um, it's not an easy mission, I don't think, uh, but I think it's pretty noble. Um, and I think that, at least for my, my take, 
Um, movies is definitely a way that we can do that. I mean, it provides so much for us, an escape um, and great experiences that take us beyond ourselves and remind us of, you know, what it is to be human and be on this planet. Okay, I don't know why those slides were in the beginning, but now we got rid of those. Here we go. This is the Roxy Theater in 1937 when it opened. Um, it opened, technically opened on September 24th, 1937. In our research, we, we got a little hung up because we found, you know, uh, announcements that the first film that would play at the Roxy was going to be on September 26th. Then we found other information that said that the first film was going to be on September 24th. And to make it even more difficult and weird, there were different movies. So they opened, this is the way the community welcomed them. They took out this full page ad of the Missoulian and all these neighboring businesses, um, you know, welcomed their newest uh, addition to the Southside Business District. As you see up in the top uh, right corner, Three Smart Girls is the, uh, the film that, that was you know, slated for the grand premiere um, on the 26th of uh, September, 1937. However, this is the gentleman, Oscar C. Paisley, who had the theater built, the original owner of the theater. Um, Mr. Paisley had a special screening the Friday prior, which was September 24th. And so this movie here, Tex Ritter's Arizona Days, was in fact the very first film that ever played at the Roxy. Both movies essentially lost to history. Um, at some point a few years ago, we played Arizona Days, and that will also be the last time we play Arizona Days. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's incredibly boring. I mean, there's a little bit of singing. It's Tex Ritter, so there's a little bit of singing. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, trouble at the corral, but it's really dry, and there's a reason why no one's ever heard of it. We have not ventured towards Three Smart Girls yet, but someday, perhaps, maybe the 90th anniversary, which we're closing in on, uh, we'll try to unspool that. Um, Mr. Paisley, the Paisley family, owned several theaters in Montana. Many of them were called the Roxy, including the Roxy in Forsyth, the Roxy in Hamilton, and another theater in Stevensville, which was not called the Roxy. I'm sorry, I don't have the name with me, but I guess it was just to avoid confusion that if he had a Roxy, you know, 10 miles away, 15 miles away in Hamilton. Um, and all of the theaters, of course, were named for the famous Roxy in New York City, which was a massive, beautiful um, movie palace. Um, here's an image of the Roxy from, I'm guessing, 19, uh, well, I could have just looked up, I could have done some research on this, huh? Um, no, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, mid 40s, maybe wartime. Uh, you've got a Betty Grable film uh, playing Springtime in the Rockies, which is just great. Uh, there's a barbershop next door, and I can tell you we were really delighted when another barbershop moved in in the last uh, five years, five or six years, Compass Barber right next door. There's a mercantile to the right of the theater, um, and that is now, of course, um, Missoula Bicycle Works. But if you stand back and look at that building, you can see that it was very much like a five and dime. Um, you know, just a, a nice, cool, uh, you know, independent store, but like a Woolworths, for example. Here's another shot. This is from 1949. This is Higgins, Higgins Avenue, just looking um, uh, north. Um, you can see the Roxy barely there on the right side. Uh, quite a wide street. I mean, I guess in reality, um, you know, it wasn't much wider, but maybe without the sidewalks or something, but um, it sure would be nice to have a street that wide out in front. This is an image from 1953, the Ten Commandments. Again, the Ten Commandments would have played um, at the Wilma and they would have kind of walked it over here for its second run. Just a little bit more history in that time. So Mr. Paisley opened the theater and very shortly after um, sold the theater to Wilma Amusement. And um, Edna Wilma, uh, the opera singer for whom the Wilma Theater was built, um, put a gentleman named Ed Sharp in charge of the operation. So by the 1950s, um, the Wilma folks owned both the Wilma Theater downtown, uh, the Roxy Theater, and the Go West Drive-In, which was out near the Y, if anyone remembers that amazing venue. Um, here's, whoops, sorry, go the wrong way. Here's another picture. Um, 
This is Dr. Zhivago, so late, late 50s. There's a great shot of the mercantile, the five and dime, that was next door to us. And that cool building, which just changed hands, that little house on the corner, which was a law firm for a number of years. But you can see how grand it once was. Hopefully, it'll come back around. And off uh, in the very distance, over by that groovy Chevy, um, oh, you know, that looks like there's a, the former uh, garage that was on the corner there. That's now a head shop if you need to stop in on your way out. <laughs> Support our neighborhood. This is Ed Sharp. Um, quite, quite a character. Um, Ed was very often seen selling tickets and concessions at the Wilma Theater. Um, again, what would have been our sort of sister theater. Um, if you notice in all of these pictures, Ed is holding a bird. It is a pigeon named Karahotu, and Ed often, more than holding the pigeon, kept the pigeon on his shoulder. Um, and often, very often, there was a lot of poop on his back where the pigeon deposited it. Um, Ed built a shrine in the basement of the Wilma called the Chapel of the Dove. This is all true, as weird as it sounds. <laughs> it was a beautiful space. It was a grotto. It was devoted to cinema. The, on either side of the screen were life-size, even larger than life-size cutouts of Humphrey Bogart on one side, Marilyn Monroe on the other. There were beautiful shrine elements like grotto pieces that had been taken out of a church. And in fact, if you head over to Rock and Rudy's, you can see the remnants of some of the, um, the Chapel of the Dove. They're in the main room, right, when you walk in where all the uh, greeting cards are. There's this great, beautiful, um, you know, uh, like a, oh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like an altar piece, like you would see in a church. And it's got, you know, you, there's a stained glass piece that's a stained glass image of Karahoto. Really cool. And also really weird. The, the first time, I, I, I'm, as I said, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I came out to visit a friend who was in college in the 80s. And um, the three things I took with me about this great town in Missoula, <laughs> I said, I'm going to live there someday. Glacier National Park, obviously not in Missoula. But I went there. I was like, what? This is a little different than suburban St. Louis. Um, at the Ox, where I had um, trout and eggs. I was like, that's a meal. And the Chapel of the Dove, I thought, this is weirder and better than I could ever expect. And, uh, <laughs> and the ch unfortunately, the chapel, of course, is long gone. Um, they, uh, there's a restaurant now, Scotty's Table, down there. There's Ed. Um, here's another nice image of the Roxy circa 1973. I mean, the release of uh, Last Tango in Paris was 1973. Um, So the Roxy in the 1970s <clears throat> was a little bit of a weird place, uh, even weirder than Chapel of the Dove, some might say. Um, there were, um, you know, for example, this film, Last Tango in Paris, uh, played here. It was rated X. It was a very controversial film at the time. And um, it fit with the vibe of the Roxy. In fact, there were pornographic films shown at the Roxy throughout the, particularly the early 1970s. Um, just a little piece of film history here. Um, you know, in 1969, the best picture was a film that was rated X. It was called Midnight Cowboy. Um, watching that film today, of course, you're, you're kind of baffled as to why, you know, it might have gotten such a severe rating. Um, but it was. It was rated by the MPAA as X. As a result, pornographers said, X, that's interesting. The MPAA never copyrighted the term, or the, you know, the letter X. They had other copyrights. They had R, they had GP, which was now PG, and they also had G for general. But they did not copyright X. So the pornographers, who were budding independent filmmakers, I suppose you could say, <laughs> ran with that. And they said, well, X, sure. These are all X movies. All of our movies are X. If you like Midnight Cowboy, you will love our X movies. And so in some sense, because of the um, you know, the influence of the counterculture and really the mores of many communities, apparently Missoula, Montana, um, X-rated movies were beginning a kind of mainstreaming. And so you'd see them showing up alongside, for example, you know, uh, independent films or documentaries. Art house is what the term eventually became. 
Um, so it was not unusual that a film like Last Tango in Paris would play, you know, because it was playing all of the art houses and it was a, you know, a very, you know, uh, you know, highly lauded uh, foreign film, but also Deep Throat and The Devil and Miss Jones and, you know, uh, The Nurses. We have some, uh, some great um, uh, advertisements from that era where, you know, you see all of the movies playing in Missoula and uh, it's always the Roxy is like some sleazy movie that's, that's happening. So. Uh, eventually, the, the theater became the regular spot uh, mid to late 70s for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And again, if you can imagine this as one big 600 seat theater, um, just packed with college kids, um, you know, they had a very, they had very cheap admission. That's in fact a feature of um, second run theaters to begin with, right? You wouldn't pay the downtown price for a movie after it had been out for a number of weeks. And the Roxy sort of ran with that. Um, in an extreme way, because by the 1980s, the Roxy was in fact a dollar show. All seats, whoops, is that the right way? No. All seats were a dollar. And just as a, you know, just as again, a little taste of the, the era, it was, there was an attempt to sort of compete with other options. You know, in the 1960s, the 1970s, really, that was it. Movies played in the movie theaters, and then eventually on TV at some point, right? But that was really much older stuff. Um, you know, some networks like ABC, you know, they made really, uh, you know, concerted efforts towards getting films when they were new and playing them as a big Sunday night release. But new in that case meant a year or two old, you know? But by the, of course, the 1980s, the home video craze had taken off, um, and the impact that that had on movie theaters was pretty severe. Um, movie theaters had already weathered television back in the 50s and had s lots of, you know, attempts to kind of overcome the popularity of people just staying home and watching movies. They did, made drive-ins, they made the screen bigger, they pumped in smells so you could see it in smell -o vision or 3D or great promoters like William Castle would wire the seats of the theater, so in, like in The Tingler, for example, so you would just have something exciting, like your seat buzzing while you were watching a scary movie. Couldn't get that at home. At least most of us couldn't, so yeah. No, but in the 80s, it was a huge, it was a uh, huge ordeal to overcome. Home video, are you kidding me? I'll just wait a little while, I'll go get the video at the store and bring it home and watch it. And then, of course, cable television, um, and then a series of blows that we now see people watching, apparently, movies on a telephone on a crosstown bus, right? So that's the kind of evolution of the personal movie experience. The impact on the Roxy was pretty severe. And in fact, um, it, was, it was probably going to close in the 19, um, by, the, by the 1990s. Things were really bad. There was a, there was a lot of sort of, um, you know, willful neglect because the, they couldn't afford to keep it up. The Wilma, incidentally, was also falling on pretty hard times. Um, and the Go West Drive, and all of these just simply because audiences were, in a way, drying up. The, the notion of, like, why one would go to a theater was lost on a number of people when, in fact, you just could watch the movies at your own home. In 19... Oh, Eddie, there's the Chapel of the Dove, by the way. There's a really nice image there. And can you see Karahoto up on the head, on his head there? <laughs> oh my God, what a guy. I'm, I am proud to say that I had an opportunity to meet Eddie Sharp. Hopefully you did too. Well, we've just passed a milestone here at the Roxy. Two weeks ago, February 19th, 1994, the Roxy Theater burned to the ground. Eddie Sharp had died shortly before the fire, and the, oops, went the wrong way. That's more exciting. I know, right? It was an epic fire. It was after a matinee screening. No one was in the building, apparently, thankfully. Um, but the soft goods, the, you know, the seats and the cushions, and just went up like that. And um, the fire was so hot that, in fact, it blew the doors across Higgins Avenue. Yeah, it was, in, it was, I was not around to see it. In fact, I, I moved back out to, I finally moved to Missoula about uh, two years after that. I'm just, 
you know, letting you know how innocent I am of this. Um, but in fact, it was arson. It was an unsolved arson. And, um, you know, a reward was put out. They never caught the person. Um, you know, the lore is that, in fact, as I said, Eddie, Eddie did die just before this. And at that time, he was the sole owner. Edna Wilma had already passed. Um, he owned this theater, he owned the Wilma, and he owned um, the Go West Drive-In, which was still in business. And Eddie, here's the story, Eddie had promised the Roxy to two different lovers. And it's pretty well known without any evidence that the fire department could, uh, could use to solve the case that one of those individuals was responsible for igniting the theater. The movie we were playing at the time was Adam's Family Values, the sequel. It is a movie we will never play at the theater again. It just seems like pushing our luck, you know what I mean? Uh, they rebuilt the theater. There was a fight over the land. Uh, there was a business, the business at the time next door, I believe, was Western Montana Lighting. Um, and they really wanted the space. I mean, it was gutted. It was just a, con you know, a concrete shell, all that really survived were the sidewalls and um, the facade. Um, but they were able to, to uh, rally, the community in fact rallied. This was a, a nice example of maybe the first time or one of the earliest times that the community said, we want this. We want a movie theater in our neighborhood. We want something like this. Um, the theater reopened in 1998 and it reopened as a dollar show. Um, they had converted the one a, a, an original space into three theaters, the way you see it now. Um, initially, it was 150 seats next door, 120 seats here, and uh, what was that the number? Oh, and, and 70 in the third theater. You know, currently you're sitting in a room that has 92, 90 seats. Um, the seats are much bigger, much more comfortable. Um, but, and there wasn't a stage. But the screen and the whole shape of the room is exactly as it was when they rebuilt it. So um, speaking from experience of coming to the Roxy, I, I came here when it was a dollar show in 98. Um, there's something kind of fortuitous about moving to town, this is the theater, and then you know, many years later, I'm up here telling you all about it. But the, the seats, and if we, we could remove this stage, you would even see where there were both, there were seats like here. So, I mean, when you got a dollar show, you're trying to do anything you can, right? Um, and what you're mostly doing is charging a lot of money for concessions. That was sort of the model back then. As you can imagine, and as you know, uh, it just didn't make it, you know? Um, at that time, there were 40 screens in Missoula. There was the Wilma still playing films. Carmike had three different movie theaters with a nine, with a three, with a... 12, you know, there was like a lot of other competition, and that was all first run movies. And then eventually, around the, the real demise for the Roxy was when Carmike opened their own dollar show. So, you know, the, the two or the, the three over on Brooks became a dollar show sometime right around the time that the Roxy reopened. So, um, so it just basically shuttered. And now we move to a different bit of our history here. I don't know why I can't remember that. that little arrow. Um, in 1977, follow me here, this will be parallel history. In 1977, a bear biologist named Charles Jonkel, who was at the Wildlife Biology Department at the Uni University of Montana, decided that he had had enough with poorly made wildlife films. Films that, you know, were unethical in their treatment of the animals to get whatever shot they were trying to get films whose science was dubious, um, and films that relied on sensationalism to tell the story of, stories of the natural world. So Chuck founded, in 1977, the International Wildlife Film Festival, sought out films from around the world, made colleagues with filmmakers, and chose a path that would provide opportunities for filmmakers to meet scientists. He, he thought that was really the biggest issue, is that folks were making films for Walt Disney and even for the BBC and you know companies that are 
also continuing to make films, but they were making films, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, for example. They were making those films without any real relationship to science and scientists. And so therefore, the kind of movies that they were making were flawed, really flawed. So we set up this festival as a way for, to bring ethics, in essence, to the form. As you may know, it, is, it was wildly successful. Um, those are, the yellow image there is an image from the very first festival. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's the second year of the festival. The, the original one was blue. Here's some early posters. Um, this is a, a parade that was started in the 19, um, in 1992? Yes, because we celebrated an anniversary um, not long ago. Um, The festival was so successful, but it was also without a home. Um, it didn't have its own theater. It would just sort of set up at the Wilma. It originally started, I said, at the university, but then moved over to the Wilma. Um, and in 2001, the organizers of the festival said, you know, well, they saw that the Wilma, I mean, the Roxy had been sitting on the market for a couple of years. They worked out a deal with the bank to purchase the building, and it became the home for the International Wildlife Film Fest. Again, the success of the fest, I gotta stop that. I have to go in the wrong direction. The success of the fest um, goes without saying, as any of you who've been around Missoula for a long time, I mean, it's a, it's a perennial event. It's, the, it's sort of the sign that spring has finally come to Western Montana um, every April. And in fact, this uh, parade, which has become really the way to launch the fest, um, is has really has marked it as this really great kind of social and community event and then um, helps funnel people to, um, to, the, to the theaters and to see the films. So flash forward a little bit, uh, 2013, um, I had, as I told you, I had moved out to Missoula. I was, um, I'd been the director for a number of years of the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival and I left the festival in 2012 um, and wasn't quite sure what I was gonna do. In late February, maybe the first week in March actually, so pretty much you know, 11 years ago this morning, <laughs> <laughs> I got a phone call from my friend Cooper, who was uh, Cooper Birchenall, who was on the board of the, of the Wildlife Film Fest. Um, he said, Mike, we, could you help us with the film festival? Um, I was like, sure, w what do you need? He's like, well, we need someone to put it on. <laughs> Uh, and I said, oh, I don't know, Cooper, I'll, I'll come down. And so I came down to the Roxy, and I learned that, you know, I didn't really know much about IWFF. I had, we had a, a little bit of a relation when I was at Big Sky, but not, not much. In fact, the organization was very insular. Um, you know, uh, and the Roxy, I, I, you know, I worked at the, uh, when I worked at Big Sky, I, I, my office was at the Wilma, I'd ride my bike past the Roxy, and there was never anything happening. It was, I, knew, I knew it because I knew what it was. You know, I'd been to the theater, but basically nothing happening here. And the long story short is that the organization just didn't really see its place in the community beyond its annual event. Um, you know, they did the festival very well, um, but that's all they did. And so board members referred to the Roxy as a very expensive office space because that's basically what it was. There is a nice office upstairs that some of you will see if you want to take the tour later. Um, but even the screenings, most of the screenings didn't happen here. They did a lot of youth screenings, matinees for kids, and so they were just renting the Wilma to do that so they could you know, deal with that capacity. Again, long story short, an underutilized organization who, who had not reached any level of uh, capacity that, that it was unsuccessful, let's just be honest. And they were really hemorrhaging. They were really losing money. So what do you do? You probably, if you want to save your wildlife film fest, you definitely want to call on a Jewish guy from the suburbs who's actually afraid of raccoons. He's probably the guy <laughs> that you need here in doing this. No, but I proposed to the organization, I proposed to the, the board, I said, let's do something. This is an example of our matinees screenings over at the university. Um, let's do something with the business. The year um, that they brought me on, of course, I just had to make a festival. It's, you know, they said, just pull this thing off. And, um, and we did. We had 
a festival. That's me dressed as a wolf right there. That's the way I snuck into the organization. Usually it's a sheep disguised as a wolf, but I turned out to be, wait, the other way around. Wolf is a sheep. Yeah, I was a sheep as a wolf. Um, in 2013, we just had an event and we brought people in and we, it was successful. But again, I said to the, the organizers, I was like, I mean, our board members, I said, you know, we could be doing something more with the building year round. And there was kind of a mission focus with the, the prior director. Oh, I think I buried the lead. The prior director had left suddenly. <laughs> um, but there was a, there was a, um, there was a, a, a mission focus that hampered the organization. The mission was to, um, I can't even remember what it is anymore, um, to, to promote awareness of wildlife habitat and the environment through film. Um, that's something that, you know, that is clearly valuable. I mean, we're still doing that with the festival. But what, what the organization decided was that was the only mission. And people, you know, we, we play these days, we play, you know, uh, you know, half a dozen or more environmental films throughout the year, and we do get audiences to come to them. But if we only played wildlife films and films about the environment, it would be impossible to maintain a theater. So we changed our mission. I told you our mission is to make the world a better place through cinema, through education, through uh, community. And in order to do that, we really uh, like took the theater in a totally different direction than it had been. We branded ourselves as Missoula's Community Cinema. I personally had a, a background in film at that point and I had been, I mentioned the Big Sky Film Festival, but I was also for 10 years the director of the Webster University Film Series, which is a very prestigious kind of, you know, high art film event uh, in St. Louis at that school. And, um, and I'd been involved with a number of different film festivals and understood that there was this thing happening in mainly in North America, but also in Europe, that was a movement. And we could call it uh, the art house movement. And mission-driven community cinemas all over the United States, uh, particularly in the you know, mid-2000s, were popping up. You know, groups were getting together, buying a theater to save it, to make it something that the community could use. You know? um, bringing movies that would otherwise not play in their community. So what we did is we undertook a bit of a remodel. We didn't have much. We had a couple of board members who could, you know, who had the means, who could give us a little support. And we had all kinds of random things around here that we just sold off to make money for paint, you know, to rent scaffolding, that kind of thing. And really myself, a couple of the children of board members, my own children, who were pretty young at the time, so let's just face it, useless. Uh, this cat right here, Chris San, the rapping cowboy, we just kind of redid the, the space. We painted it out, we brought in uh, someone to kind of revamp the concession stand. To give you an idea, all of the candy in the concession stand was expired when I started here 11 years <laughs> ago. Um, and we, we opened in August of 2013, so we basically spent the summer kind of redoing the place, getting it ready. I had relationships with a number of uh, independent film distributors from doing festivals and doing that other film series, and I, I brokered deals that's, you know, like, hey, what if you just give us, can we just get a 50% cut, right? We'll play the movie for the weekend, and then we'll send whatever back after, you know. And again, I knew a lot of these folks, so they were very um, generous and, and knew what we were trying to do and believed in it. Um, and eventually, very soon, uh, we were able to buy a DCP. We got a grant for a digital cinema uh, projector. And that meant we could not only play films, you know, that were, um, that would look better, but we could, uh, you know, videos that would look better. We, got, we could also get access to mainstream first-run movies and not the obscure stuff. For, to give you an idea, the first week, uh, the first month in, in August when we opened the theater, the first film we played was called uh, Fierce Green Fire, and it was a really interesting documentary about the history of the environmental movement. I thought, well, there's a nod to IWFF, right? We'll start there. The other film we played was called A Band Called Death, 
and it was about a punk rock band from Detroit from 1970, African American band, three piece, that actually invented punk. You know, you think of the Sex Pistols or Dead Kennedys. I know you're all thinking of the Sex Pistols, the Dead. <laughs> um, but it really was this band that started in Detroit. So we started with these kind of fairly obscure couple of documentaries. We played a Kurosawa movie that month, you know, just kind of eking along. And, um, but then we got this DCP projector and the timing was impeccable. We got it the week that the Academy Awards were on, you know. Birdman had never played in Missoula because just a little side note, um, the Wilma Theater was also in in great decline at that point. They made the choice not to upgrade to the digital cinema, so they couldn't play the first run movies. They could play things on Blu-ray or maybe if they got a film print, which is pretty rare. Um, but it was headed out and it was clear, the writing was on the wall. In fact, the owner of the theater was a, was a friend of mine and was trying to sell it to me. I was like, that's a great idea. What am I gonna do with that? I, anyway, um, and where the hell would I get that money? Um, of course, the history of that theater is great because it then turned the corner into something that our town really, really needed. We didn't really need a 900-seat movie theater, but to have a cool music venue downtown is, is pretty wonderful. Anyway, I'm digressing. We opened the theater that weekend, and guess what? Birdman won Best Picture. And then all of a sudden, everybody's like, well, Birdman, what's that? And they came to the Roxy, and we played it for like six or seven weeks. And we were like, what? Because meanwhile, the other kinds of movies we were playing, we were busting our butts just to let people know what they were, right? I told you the guy was like, no, it's great. It's about a band from Detroit. You'll love it. Never heard of them. You know, some adventurous people were coming. But finally, we realized, oh, right. Academy Award helps. But just think about these films that are in first run. The difference between the 50 bucks that we paid to promote it on Facebook and the $50 million that they're you know, spending to run a marketing campaign for a movie, it's considerable. And um, it was this, this uh, light bulb went off for us that, oh, right, get the movies that people have already heard of because somebody else is you know, footing the bill to, to tell you about them. So anyway, it was a game changer for us. I wanna show you something here. Um, let's get away from that. Um, this is that first year at the Roxy. We had such a great year. We started, um, we started getting ahead of ourselves and we thought there's all kinds of other things we could be doing. Um, membership and you know, partnerships and all sorts of, um, and then we just kind of embraced it. So I wanna show you, this is after we made it through the first year, we made this film and this sort of like, you know, well, you'll see what it does.
in the slow fade out. Um, yeah, so you get the idea. Did any of you come to the Roxy that year? Yay, thank you. <laughs> it's really nuts to look at that because I'm I can't I mean we've shown many of those movies again, you know, because they're they're popular and we people want to see them again. But to think of how much we did that first year, um, we had a kind of um, let me just see if I can get this back where I need it to be. Um, we had a kind of uh, we had an approach that I call all brow, right? Uh, you saw examples of you know, terrible movies like uh, Pink Flamingos, which is a brilliant movie. It's not that bad. I mean, it's terrible, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> Troll 2 and just, you know, movies that are just slumming it, you know, trash, honestly. Um, Pauline Kael, the great film critic from the, the uh, New York Times, said, um, you know, if most films are trash, so if you have no interest in trash, you have no business watching movies. And she's right. Frankly, there's only a few of them that are really, really good, like The Fugitive, for example. Um, but Allbrow, this approach that says there's something here for everyone in our community, whether it's adventure, sports films, ski films that Missoula loves, or classic cinema, or first-run films, documentaries. Our mix is something like this. It's really pretty much like this still. Um, we play every year what I would just call independent film, whatever that is exactly. Many independent films, of course, are distributed by major studios, their subsidiaries, or, or they just kind of fit right in. We're playing Dune Part 2 right now at the theater. I would not call that an independent movie. Mm -hmm. There's something about the spirit of it, this uh, director that's really um, beloved by, you know, a film nerd world um, that kind of brings him into the, the fold of so-called independence. He's an auteur. I guess that's what it is. We play, you know, uh, about 10% of our annual content is, a, is foreign film, small percentage of documentary, but um, that the market uh, really doesn't support documentary in the way that it maybe we thought we were going to. And the, our repertory offerings are probably about 15% of what we bring up. That might be more this last year, in, in fact, when I, the more I think about it. Um, but we established pretty early on that, that we would have special programming to market our films so that if you liked something, you could probably find it. So we have a uh, monthly series. These are going way back. We have this great series called Murray Me, uh, three films by Bill, with Bill Murray. Um, totally 90s summer, this great series that had like Jurassic Park and um, um, Terminator and big, big movies from the 90s that people wanted to see. Where we would play these just once a week, you know. Carpenter Things was a, um, around the time that uh, Stranger Things came out, um, you know, there was an interest in, it's always an interest, but there was a special interest in John Carpenter since his films are very influential to that series. So we ran a series of, you know, five, five of his movies. Um, we've had ongoing monthly installments of things like indigenous cinema, films, films by Native American filmmakers. Movie cult is our Saturday night party movies, basically. They don't have to be cult movies in the same sense that maybe we all grew up with, but um, they're cultish in the sense that the audience is cultish. Like, they're really into this thing. They're into Mean Girls tonight, okay? They really are watching that. Out at the Roxy is our LGBTQ series, which has been going on for um, pretty much 10 years. Uh, there was a little pause in it, but we've been running that series almost from, since the beginning. Cinema Abroad and Essential Cinema are two series that we've run, again, since the beginning, that first year. That first month, we played uh, an essential film, which was um, uh, Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa. Um, and the idea that all of these different kinds of programs could coexist, you know? That again, there's something for everyone at the theater. Something about nostalgia and the way that works um, and our own relationship to movies. I mean, as I said when I started out, I really do believe that the mission that we're up to, making the world a better place through cinema, it's a difficult job, but it's also pretty easy, honestly. Because if, you, if we connect to the community, we embrace uh, you know, the community and provide what the community wants, there's this experience that they have that the movie gives them. We're, we're only doing like a tiny part of the job, which is like, oh, we picked E.T., please come see it tonight. And then you watch E.T. and you're like, 
you're blown away. You, you thought, oh, when I saw it a long time ago, it was just a kid's movie. But now you're, you're much older and you're like, oh my God, it's about the end of innocence and childhood and divorce, it's so heartbreaking. I wanna get on that spaceship and leave the planet with the little ET, right? Or just revisiting movies and the way that we, that, the way that they bring us so much. I mean, the night that uh, we were a little bit more nimble uh, in the past and the night that Prince died, the night that we heard Prince died, we just said, we're gonna play the movie tonight. And we put it up on the internet, come see it if you wanna check it out with us. This place was packed, um, people were dancing in the aisle, we played Purple Rain, um, and it was a cathartic experience for people who just loved that musician so much, and the music, but also maybe beyond that, what it represents, and I think that's the nostalgic piece, because you know, there's, there's something kind of great about being able to buy a Blu-ray of a movie and own it. Right? Just like buying a record and, and owning it. You have a little piece of Bob Dylan, right? Because he's in your heart already, and now you have his record. The same is true for, I think, our experience with movies, whether you're actually physically possessing them or you're coming to them because you're, you know, you are, um, you know, sort of uh, connecting to the movie up here on the screen in that, with your gaze. You're bringing that into you. It's a very, my take on it is a very, spiritual experience, honestly. And there's no surprise that movie theaters, the best ones, the most beautiful ones, are all modeled after a church, right? I mean, they look like a beautiful cathedral where you're going to, um, you know, to connect with a, with a film. I'll leave Harry Potter out of this for now. And um, Jimmy Stewart's just a voyeur, so we know. That's what we are when we're here, so. So about, um, a few years into the operation, we realized, okay, the, we've got an audience. We've got people uh, who want to come to the theater. We didn't have, a, um, we didn't have an uh, independent fiction film festival in the state of Montana at the time. So we thought, why don't we have a festival that brings new independent films that aren't playing elsewhere? You know, some festivals existed, but they were a combination of documentary and fiction. But what if we just brought fiction films and at the same time, we could celebrate the history of film in Montana. You know, there's so many great movies that have been made here. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot and, uh, you know, Always, uh, Winter in the Blood a few years ago. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we could show those films and new films and bring people to our community and they could embrace. This is, um, this is the founders of the festival, Aaron Roos and Andrew Rizzo. They were both employees here and they, um, they made this their special project while they were here. Um, in the middle there is a, another former employee, the great Lily Gladstone. And if you got some time on Sunday, I would recommend tuning into the Academy Awards and watching her receive her Academy Award for Best Actress. Next to Lily is um, Ken Turan from the Los Angeles Times. And this was the, Second year of the festival, we brought these folks out and, um, and were able to show Lily's then kind of debut major motion picture, Certain Women. Just a little plug, we're playing that this month as a special series, uh, which you would come check out. And then also over in the Senior Center parking lot, we, we played an outdoor screening of The Princess Bride during the festival for no reason whatsoever, but it was just really fun to watch it out there. Yeah, it was a great event. Um, all in all, it was uh, four days long. We brought in uh, 10 different features, 20 shorts, 25 filmmakers, and 2,500 people came to the festival. That's kind of um, been the vibe ever since we started it. Um, some years a few more, some years a few less, but around that number of films, and it's just a really fun weekend where we celebrate independent cinema. And some of those films are films that we might not have an opportunity to play otherwise, um, but other films are films that we just start you know, at the festival and then they come back later in the year, for example, or maybe right into it. We also established, as part of our mission, um, working with kids to make the future filmmakers, we have something called the Roxy Film Academy, which is largely a summer program. Um, and, uh, and we do filmmaking classes throughout the year. Um, and then there's this other thing we do, which is like everything else. Who knows what it is? It's the most random stuff that happens here. Sometimes there's music on the stage or a play. That's Mason Wagner, the local director and actor. Uh, there's a gorilla at the concession stand. I can't tell you why. I don't know what those people in the middle are. One of them seems to have an eyeball on their head. 
um, you know, sriracha and ketchup, our volunteers. Um, we also then established a children's film festival originally called Hoot Nanny, um, and it was, uh, it was uh, more than uh, movies, it was like a, um, um, activities for kids, like ninja training, um, you know, because you gotta get these kids started early. Um, and that morphed into an, a program that we began with the um, Arts Missoula. Uh, and it, it's now called Kidomatic. We took a year off last year um, because we have some staffing change, but Kidomatic will be back in the, in the fall. And it's similar. It's like a, you know, similar to what it always was. It was like a weekend long uh, festival with uh, movies and other things for kids. Um, also the Wildlife Film Fest. Still going strong, it's coming up in, in April. Um, tip, the biggest one we had was in 2019, and we, we had 120 films in the festival. A huge attendance, about 8,000 people, and it, we actually somehow ended up with two extra days than we normally do, which I have no excuse for. How's everybody doing? Yes. You all right? Any questions so far? Okay. Let's cruise along. Um, sometime mid-tenure for me, it was clear that we had established an audience and that we had, you know, we, we had all sorts of fun board and uh, capacity building things had happened. We had done a strategic plan. We had determined, for example, that, um, you know, what's most important is the relationship we have with our community um, and, th and the stewarding of this building. It's something that the, you know, the, the first 10 years or so of owning the building um, uh, wasn't quite in touch with. It was a brand newish building, right? I mean, it had just kind of all been built, so there wasn't necessarily a, a impulse to do something, you know, other than pay the electric bill and, you know, sweep up. Um, when they rebuilt the Roxy after the fire, they built it with a, with a strange um, and, uh, problematic, I should say, <laughs> marquee. So I decided we should try to get back to what the theater always was. The, I don't have a good picture, but you can see Governor Steve. Um, we welcomed him one day when he gave us a great big check for $150,000. That's usually when we welcome politicians to the building. <laughs> um, but we were embarking on a campaign to redo the exterior, um, to bring back the ticket window, to bring back the marquee to its original splendor. This one that they put on, this sort of stucco covered one they put on um, was, uh, you know, it was fine, it worked. Like a, when I proposed this to the board, there was a board member that says, what's wrong with the current marquee? Doesn't it work? <laughs> I was like, well, it, wor it works, but it doesn't really work. Because what it wasn't doing was it wasn't announcing the excitement of what's going on inside the theater. I just went through like 10 slides that showed you how awesome it was inside the theater, but outside it looked like it could have been an outpatient building or something, you know? It was just kind of a boring architecture. And um, so we embarked on this campaign and we made it right in time um, for our 80th anniversary. That night, apropos of the 80th anniversary, we showed Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs out in the parking lot. It came out that same year, 1937. Um, and as you can see across the street, the marquee is all lit up. We did a special lighting of that marquee. I know, it's beautiful, isn't it? And I think it really does say something cool is going on in here. I mean, there's a reason marquees were designed to be so beautiful and, and uh, vibrant and attractive. And this is nothing. I mean, this is honestly, we love our building, but it's so humble compared to some of what got made in that era, you know? Um, even the original Wilma marquee, so exciting, with the flag on the outside of the building. Um, the following year, we couldn't leave well enough alone. We knew we had another issue, and it was our seats. Our really wonderful um, development director, and I'm not just saying that because he's sitting over here. Tammy Baldovic embarked on this great campaign to redo the seats here. Um, we pulled out the old ones, but if you liked them, we kept them. They're over in the annex. Um, at least some of them. Um, and we had these, uh, these custom made. We went there, you know, this great weird little company in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan called Irwin Seating Company. So if you need movie seats, 
and you want them to be made in the United States. Well, there's your one choice, as it turns out. Um, so we went there and we had them, uh, you know, got a tour of the factory where we got to put things on our heads and ride around in golf carts. It was, I wish you could have been there with me. It was really great. No, we had these beautiful seats and the, the side uh, plate designed by um, our dear friend Tess Hastings, who's an artist and production designer in film. We also brought back 35 millimeter to the theater. Um, this is slightly out of order. <laughs> there it is. Uh, that's our buddy. That's not my son, by the way. Um, that's just some kid who works here. No, that's, that's Cal Bailey, uh, who could be confused for my son. Um, he's uh, there at the, at the rewind tables with 35 millimeter film. Um, we have a program which brings films in monthly. Um, as you might know, most motion pictures, new released films, are not available on 35 millimeter film. They're digital releases. On occasion, uh, films do get released. And in fact, this is a picture from this last summer where Cal is rewinding Oppenheimer on 35 millimeter. Also a little plug, we're starting it on Friday on 35. We got the print back um, in time for the Academy Awards because it's certainly the front runner and everybody's head would spin if it didn't win. Um, but if you didn't get a chance to see it at all or on 35 millimeter, I'd highly recommend coming to check it out. It's quite epic. Um, but it's really wonderful, and I'm just looking around the room, and it's quite clear that everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about when I say 35 millimeter film. But what you might not remember is how glorious it really is, and how different it actually is. You know, the technology is wonderful, and certainly the Roxy could not exist without this digital technology, which, in fact, is often delivered over the internet. We don't even have to wait for FedEx to arrive with a digital print. We can download it to play. I know, it's a drag. However, we couldn't really be doing what we're doing without the technology in place to be able to, to show this because it's so cost prohibitive uh, to ship a print. Leave Oppenheimer out of the picture because it's actually twice the size as most movies, but um, the ship a print is upwards of $150, right? And then we have to recoup the cost on that. There's labor to, to play it. The reality is there could be no Roxy as we know it with, without the digital format. However, the joy of watching a film on spool on 35 millimeter, whether you're partial to the artifacts that show up or just the warmth and definition that's part of the 35 millimeter projection process. Next time we do a film, well, Oppenheimer's the next one we're doing, but we'll certainly have another special feature coming up in April. I highly encourage you to come experience that because it'll, it really will. It'll blow your mind how great it looks. But you don't have to tell these folks, they're all about it. That's theater three where we, um, where we have the 35 millimeter projection. And um, you know, by the time that all of these improvements were made, the 35 millimeter projectors, the new seats, the marquee, the Roxy was humming. Um, you know, we had the most membership, we developed a membership program that some of you may be familiar with. Um, we had the most members we'd ever had. We had the highest grossing film that we'd ever had playing on the screen. Um, and then this thing happened. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> but for us, it was kind of a hit. <laughs> we didn't know what to do. So we did what everybody else did. We got a puppy. We baked bread, <laughs> yoga, a lot of walks, time with the fam. <laughs> no, but we, we got a lot of coverage for it. Um, but um, more than some businesses, I will say, and I'm not trying to evoke pity, I'm just trying to relive this moment uh, nearly four years ago, we were really screwed because what we do is right here, right? We, and we couldn't do this. Gathering is the first part of our business. You have to gather and you have to be together. So there were, there were things that were offered to us um, you know, during that time, um, most of which didn't quite work for what we did. So we had to find ways to, to, to make, it, make it happen. So I'll tell you a few things that happened. We had to let go about half our staff. We had about 25 people on staff at that point, and there were about 10 or 12 people that made it through what ended up being a year-long closure. More than that, 500 and, do you remember? 529? 529. 539 days we were closed, from March 13th to you know, later the next year in June. Um, yeah, so we had to, and, and you know, one thing that we had started 
uh, was a project next door, which is now the annex. So we had already signed a lease on that space. Um, the irony is it was even smaller than this room. <laughs> you know? Like we're not gathering here, we're certainly not gathering there. Um, but we did uh, do some work while we had the time off and we turned the back space, this was all overgrown with Ibravitas and um, I have a few more before pictures. That's a lot nicer than it looked before for some reason because it really didn't look that nice. <laughs> But we decided, okay, everybody's saying, everybody around the country, we had lots of you know, friends who had other spaces, movie theaters who were running them all over the world, mainly in the US. They were doing outdoor screenings. There was, you know, that, was, that seemed to be okay. We could get a dozen or 12, 15 people together and watch something outside. Maybe we can do that. So we did, we turned this space out there into what we call the Roxy uh, Garden. And it's an outdoor movie theater. Um, there's me trying to put the screen together. And um, what we end up with is something like this. Again, we couldn't do anything with the inside of the building, the annex, because we weren't going to use it um, to, for, for public screenings. But this is a mix of things. This wasn't all during the pandemic, but this is to tell you, this is to show you what it became. And we, with social distancing, I think we initially had 20 people back on that patio. And as things kind of, you know, by the next year when, things, when, when the vaccine was out there and people were more comfortable gathering, we could fit more, more people. Now we could probably squeeze 50 people out on the patio if, if they want to be there. Um, we also went through the construction of this annex space next door. Again, there's our nice old seats. Um, and it's a 25 seat room. It gives us an opportunity to show movies we wouldn't otherwise be able to, you know, to, to audiences. Um, small audiences, or sometimes we can play a film here and when it taps out or when it slows down considerably, we can move it over the annex to keep it for an extra week or two. Um, that's eventually what happened, but during that time, during the pandemic, the annex became a space for people to gather with their own pods, you know, a movie party or a video game party. We promoted this idea of bringing your video game and playing it up on the big screen. Very successful. Um, also, these theaters were rented out if you, let's say you had more people in your pod, or you just wanted to stay away from your pod, and you want to be back there and there. And there. Um, this space was better for that. The other thing that we did that was hugely successful is we had a partnership with another place in town that couldn't do anything with their space either, and that was the Paddlehead Stadium, Oberon Park. And um, this is a, clearly, overhead view of the park, what you don't see at the very, very top, you can see the illumination of it, but that's the screen in the center field, which is a super bright screen, which if you've ever been to a day game, you can read during the day. So we were playing movies at the ballpark. We called it center field cinema. And we booked an entire summer, 2020, of movies. And you can see the squares that are drawn, rectangles and squares that are drawn. People would purchase those uh, squares for their group. They'd sit out and watch the movies and it was just a summer of big time fun bangers and we could be together, we could watch movies and we could not make each other sick. <laughs> I mean that idea goes pretty far actually. I feel like just, we could, if we could just please not make each other sick. Let's try that. Not that kind of sick. I just mean, never mind. It's a failed joke. That's what I'm saying. Um, no, but it's hugely successful. And we played, again, that movie. I mentioned Purple Rain, people dancing out in the field, and the Talking Heads movie stopped making sense. But also, really, just great, fun summer movies. Jaws. Uh, Jaws was really fun out there. Goonies. Uh, we played Mean Girls. We played uh, Back to the Future. Um, one of my favorite films that we played there was A League of Her Own. And one of the reasons why is because, uh, you can't quite tell because it's overhead, there was also dugout seating. So I got to sit in the dugout and watch A League of Her Own, which I thought was pretty cool. Here's another view of that. We slowly started to, uh, the following year, following spring, we, we got the, the wildlife uh, film fest going. These people know each other, which is why they're sitting so close. Don't get alarmed. Um, and we started showing films out in the, garden for that festival and found a way to keep that thing going. Um, and this is really, this is the crew from the Wildlife Film Fest that year. Um, you know, I won't, I won't get to say too much because I will weep <laughs> up here on stage. <laughs> uh, 
But it's like, this is why these kind of folks who just stayed with the Roxy, there were, there, were way, there were things that provided. I mean, there was unemployment possibilities. There were you know, ways to kind of try to move on. But there were so many people, there was about 10 people who stayed with the theater and just carried us through, all of our board members as well. And then eventually we announced, we had some metrics like, what will we do? What would it be that we, we know we can reopen? Um, you know, because we heard about other places reopening and we just didn't feel that comfortable. I won't get into the politics of it, but there were certain things that weren't in place in our state that would make anyone who worked in an industry like this feel safe. We were doing weird stuff. I mean, we had bleach guns and stuff. I mean, we were doing everything we could to try to make the place seem or be safer for those parties. But in terms of just a bunch of, you know, um, anonymous people getting together, again, the heart of what our business is, we just didn't feel safe. And so we just decided like, what would those be? And some of those were the number of cases and how we were all following, you know, where that was, um, the percentage of vaccinations, all sorts of things that we said, these are the things. And as it turns out, we finally had an opportunity to do it. And, um, and we reopened June, do you remember June? Yeah, I think it was June 4th. And we did it super slow too. We're like, we're just showing movies in this one theater and then we'll show them in the other theater. And then, you know, it was almost like how we started, you know, weekends only. Um, but eventually um, everybody got a lot more comfortable. And um, one of the first films, in fact, I think the first film we played, well, we played this film called um, Nomad, which was, um, had won the Academy Award, really lovely film. And it would have been a movie we would have played for sure, but we were closed. So we played it as kind of a soft open. And then the next week we played In the Heights, which is a beautiful musical, a Lin-Manuel Emanuel musical um, that kind of, it was, very, it was very successful. We limited the seating, you know, so that we wouldn't pack it. And we, I think we almost sold out that half theater that we made available, you know. So we felt like we were on the right track. And then, Oh, well, then this happened, and we were all back into it. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I want to go make bread and hang out with my dog. I kind of miss all that. Um, yeah, and here's an example of the, um, the um, Montana Film Fest. This is just from last year. We're really back in it. A, a group of uh, cowboys and uh, Native folks and ranchers and a bunch of folks who starred in this movie called Butcher's Crossing all came uh, to the screening. Um, and this is the gang as we know it. That's our current staff right now, minus uh, one person who actually just moved. But um, that's who runs the theater, our front of house staff, our administrative staff, our film festival staff. And so all of this stuff that I've jazzed about here for the last hour um, is because of these amazing creative people who are super passionate about cinema, about the arts, about community, and about this building. You know, people who just really want this building to be what it is every day. Just a little Roxy by the numbers for you. When we started, this is extreme. <laughs> when we started in 2013, there was one employee. Hi, that's me, I'm Mike. Uh, we're currently at 24 full, uh, full-time equivalent or whatever, you know, people who are year-round employees, not quite full-time, but um, I think there's about, um, about half of those folks are actually full-time. Um, that first year, we did 50 screenings. Granted, it was a shorter, you know, slight, a shorter year of sorts, um, but this year, we did 2,867 screenings. And that means we played Barbie, you know, like 100 times or whatever, but that's every screening, um, not just that many different titles. Um, the revenue that first year, which is to say the budget that I inherited was $167,000. Um, I mean, I know it's 10 years ago, but that was only, <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. It was really nuts. And there's a reason why there was only one employee because there was no money. We've increased, uh, just this last year, we're, you know, our budget is 1.5. Um, really, it'd be nice to have more <laughs> just because we do so much. That first year, we were able to bring in 2,500 people, which is pretty impressive. That includes the film festivals, the film festival that we did. 
This year's attendance to the Roxy was 68,000 people through the turnstiles. And back then, we had no members because we didn't have a membership program. And today, I think this is up to date. We've got about, I think it's closer to 1,800. Sorry, I didn't revise that. Um, but pushing 2,000 members to an organization that, that has only had that membership program for like eight years. You know? Anyway, that's that. Um, in some ways, I feel like this is, the, this is how I want to leave this for you, if it'll play. It is. It's worth seeing. You would like, you'd be like, what? This goes way back, as you can see, it's the old marquee. But this, to me, summarizes my experience of the last 11 years at the Roxy Theater. I was just coming to work, and this is what I saw. Are any of you pictured in that video? <laughs> Honestly, I have no explanation. I don't know why that happened. It was a beautiful thing to see. And it gave me a sense that like, oh, what we're doing is working. You know, it's really working. Um, and I was reminded you know, as I, w I told you, I would drive by, a ride by on a bicycle, and there was just nothing going on at the Roxy. And I see something like that happening just right in front. Again, not sanctioned, you know. We don't know what they're doing or why. Um, but it just made me feel like, okay, we've arrived. We're a Missoula place. Well, that's, um, that's pretty much the history of the theater. I don't know if you have any questions, if there's anything I missed. or if there's Oh, you do have a question, yes. Surprise. You haven't mentioned the, uh, the broadcasts from the Metropolitan. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we do present monthly um, the Met Opera Live. It's a program that, in fact, when I said nothing was going on at the Roxy, it was one of the only things that was happening regularly. And um, it was run by uh, Morris Productions. Um, and that's something that we took over um, just to facilitate it in a more you know, sort of part of our, all of our other programming. And we still present that. Um, sadly, the attendance for Met Opera has really not bounced back after, um, after the pandemic. And I just read that um, the endowment, uh, they had to borrow, unfortunately, like, I don't know, a huge amount from their endowment, the Met itself. So hopefully that ship can get righted. Um, but in conjunction with the Met Opera, another piece of that programming is the National Theater Live, which are beautifully filmed, you know, um, stage performances that come from, the, you know, through the National Theater in the UK. Um, it's funny I didn't mention that because I mentioned a lot of lowbrow programming. That to me is an example, that's the height of our highbrow programming. Where did the lowbrow come from with the can? Yeah, that, that's an image from A Trip to the Moon. It's a film from 1903, French film directed by Georges Méliès. Um, it's con really widely considered, you know, the earliest or one of the earliest, certainly, um, narrative films. It's the first science fiction movie. Um, and uh, the notion is, you know, uh, for us, is this is this great, campy, but um, artful uh, history of cinema. And for whatever reason, I, when I came back uh, that summer in 2013, I had to take a trip back to St. Louis. I saw a circus performance, a really small circus, um, at Circus Flora, and they did a reenactment of that film as their circus theme. And so I had that on my mind, and I was like, wow, actually, trip to the moon, boom, that'll be perfect. So I gave the idea to a designer, um, and that's our logo. It references the whole beautiful history of cinema. It all started right there and still has so much, um, it's so captivating. I get asked, and I'm not making this up, I get asked maybe every month where the logo comes from. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. now you know. Yes? Um, before I get to my question, I want to compliment you. Uh, my wife and I are members. Uh, yes, you are. A few years ago. And I would say we, 
we only live five minutes away from the big um, AMC and at the um, Southgate Mall. So it would be really easy. But probably eight or nine films out of ten, we come here instead of go to the big box places. So I'm curious to know. Thank you, Lee. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it seems like there's beginning to be a, maybe a trend where big box theaters are starting to have more art movies because it seems like you have plenty of the, the Academy Award movies, yeah. but you also have these others too that wouldn't make it into the big theaters. Yeah. So is that a new trend where art theaters are trying to steal some of the business from the big boys? And conversely, are the big boys starting to have some more art films? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question, and I think it, it illuminates the state of the film industry. You know, I sort of glazed over the real challenge we have. I talked a lot about, you know, videotapes in the 80s. <laughs> but the real challenge is, of course, streaming service. And, you know, yeah. you, uh, and, and not just the access that we all have, as long as we have, you know, a computer or a smart TV or whatever, but the shrinking window of opportunity for theaters. It used to be 14 weeks. 14 weeks to play a movie, tap it out. Nobody, no other opportunity to see it. Now movies go sometimes simultaneous to streaming services or have a minimal window of three, maybe four weeks before they're available. So, you know, f not necessarily for the Roxy, we've kept things very affordable, $10 tickets um, with senior discounts, um, but also very affordable concessions. We make it very possible for anyone to come to the theater. Um, but compare that to big box, I guess you could call them, you know, the circuits, the major chains, $15, $20 for movie tickets. And so if the, op if the option is, hey, let's wait, if you're a family, a family of four, you know, let's wait and watch the new Disney movie when it's streaming for 25 bucks for all of us versus $80 and then the concessions and then the, you know, it's, it's an, uh, it's unfortunate, and it's part of it's it's economic, uh, frankly, because the theaters still need to make money. They've got these big houses which they never seem to fill, particularly in our community, and so their prices are that high because they're just trying to make a buck. I have empathy for them, but I also think they're trying anything they can. And so, more to your question, the reality is anybody can have pretty much any movie right now. If we wanted to try to open, except Disney, but that's a different story. If we wanted to open Dune two which we did, it was just simple as requesting it. If a, if a AMC thinks that they'll do well with, you know, um, there's a film coming out, speaking of our good friend Lily Gladstone, called um, Fancy Dance, which we played at the Film Fest as a lovely character study. Lily's become a household name. She'll be even more of a household name after Sunday. If the AMC thinks they're gonna make money playing Fancy Dance, okay, sure. But it's a very small film. It's the kind of thing that you wouldn't expect to be in a theater like that. But the reality is they're just trying to find what's gonna put butts in seats. And in terms of repertory programming, classic films, they're also trying that. But the missing piece for them is uh, the ear of a community, the ear of an audience that is interested in that. And also a, um, a direct line to promote that programming because it's just not in place for them. So, um, it's, I, I know because I can see the box office on that. They're not doing that well with that. So for example, every year we play Die Hard for about three or four days around Christmas, and we kill. It's great. We pack the theater. We sell out every screening of Die Hard. Meanwhile, Die Hard this last year also played at the AMC, and we looked at the two-week-long run that they did. We did better in four days than they did playing the movie for two weeks, you know? Or was it just three? It's just three, so. Anyway, that, but that's the shape of the industry, and I think in a town like Missoula, where you have, you, you know, you go to Portland or you go to Seattle, art house cinemas are smaller independent theaters, you know, they're, they're more numerous, um, and the big uh, AMCs and the chains like Carmike, et cetera, um, Regal, they're numerous as well, but you've just got that many more people to serve. Yeah, is there a question over here? Oh, a quick comment and then a question. Um, I want to commend you and your team for sticking with it from the beginning through hard times and, and then COVID and you could have left at any time and said I can't do this or it's not going to work so we benefit and I just want you to know we appreciate all this. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much. And then my question is how do you 
what's really the process for us? what movies you're going to show? I mean, who decides and how far ahead and yeah. know, all that? Just curious about that. Well, there's two. So we do a monthly calendar of films. Um, and those films, by and large, are decided about a month ahead of time. Tomorrow at uh, 1 o'clock. <laughs> Come on by if you want to give us an idea. No, we have a programming team, which is made up of anyone on staff who wants to attend, and there's usually about a dozen folks. Um, there are a couple of programmers who do regular monthly series. Christina Tripp, who's our concessions manager and rentals manager, also has a series called Roxy Book Club. So every month she has a film that is also a book. She encourages people to read the book before you watch the movie, and then they have a discussion. Um, Mike Smith, who's our house manager, has this series called Inferno of Danger, and it's international action movies which play on a Friday night. So those kinds of series out at the Roxy, I also mentioned there's a programmer for that, Charlotte McCorn. Those kinds of series are selected by those individuals. They say, you know, either in relation to the community or community organization or another business, et cetera, they might say, hey, here's the movie we're going to do, and they tell me, and I book it. The rest of the month, like our special series, that's all sort of hammered out. Um, indigen or, um, uh, essential Cinema, that program where we play a classic film, it's just brought up in discussion. Sometimes it's related to, oh, so-and-so's got a new movie coming out. You know, Vim Vendors, for example, has Perfect Days, the film that's nominated for Best uh, Foreign Film. Um, he is, um, that film is playing uh, here at the theater, and so we chose one of his other films, Paris, Texas, to play as essential cinema. It's that, so it's just hashed out. The other films, the first run films, we actually do have a booker who um, you know, deals with the studios and deals with some of the bigger distributors um, to book the first run movies. So Dune 2 was something that Jan Klingelhofer, our dear booker, something that she handled. But a lot of the booking, because of my own background in you know, dealing with distributors, a lot of that booking I just do. So that's the divide. The new stuff is kind of, Jan tells us, this is available to us. It's very rare that we're turned down, as I said, particularly these days, because this also, it's not just the theaters, Lee, but it's also the distributors just want their movies out there. Fine. You want to play it? You only have 90 seats? Cool. That's great. The AMC is not going to fill up more than 90 anyway. So you know what I mean? It's, it's just the shape of the business right now. In the very back, so who owns the Roxy now, and how does that ownership of the theater relate to the larger building that it's a part of? Yeah, I love this question, because the answer is, you own the Roxy. The Roxy is a nonprofit, and, you know, it's like any charity, owned by, uh, owned and for the public good. We do have a board. Um, in the last 11 years, I couldn't give you the exact date, but it was about six, maybe six years ago, we decided to change the name of our organization to the Roxy Theater. It had been the Wildlife Film Fest owning the Roxy, and in that sort of adjustment of mission, it didn't make so much sense that our organization would be called this one event that we do, right? Because the Wildlife Film Fest fits perfectly into community cinema. Community cinema, not so much into Wildlife Film Fest. So that's the kind of like, I forget, I think we used an umbrella. <laughs> we flipped the umbrella over, right? Like, we're putting all these things in this umbrella and it doesn't work, but if we did, whoa, wow. Anyway, if we did this and flipped it over, that's what it is. So yeah, if you have a board of about nine people, nine-ish people, they're all people. I just mean I'm trying to get the count. Um, and uh, yes, and so I think that does answer the question, right? So that's the kind of different, slightly different shape. The building itself, though, um, since we are the Roxy Theater, right, we have every interest in stewarding this historic theater. Um, and again, with a broad mission to make the world a better place through cinema, community, education, all of those things that, you know, at the very beginning of this presentation when I showed you all those logos, I mean, all of those are, in essence, our program. This is what we do here. <laughs> well, thank you all. I really appreciate it. Um, I've gone the full time.
But, um, but I work here, so if you want to stick around and you want a little tour of the place, I will certainly, certainly show you around.